Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining. I like the, the red hats. Don't uh, be shy. Put them on. I can put mine on, too, if you want. <laughs> um, so uh, this talk is about uh, scaling uh, Java applications really fast. Um, and so that's kind of the premise of the, of the talk. So we're going to be talking about Quarkus, about Knative as tools that, that enable that. So um, a little bit about me first. Um, so my name is uh, Kevin Dubois. I work at, uh, at Red Hat, hence the, the Red Hat, of course. Um, this is me wearing a suit once, uh, once a year. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm a solution architect and a developer advocate at Red Hat. So I basically, I wear two different hats. <laughs> anyway, so um, in my uh, previous life, before uh, working at Red Hat, uh, most of my career was spent uh, as, a, as a software engineer and mostly in the, in the United States, so hence my, my accent. Um, but I was born and raised in, in Belgium, so and that kind of explains why I also speak uh, more languages than just English. Uh, so I speak Dutch, French, uh, Italian, and then uh, maybe later on after a few drinks, <laughs> a little bit of German and Spanish. Um, so what I do at Red Hat is I, I try to focus on a developer experience, uh, really try to make uh, you know developing fun with open source tools, and uh, try to focus on you know how can we be productive, do it in a fun way, and and most of all, again, you know open source is really close to my heart. Um, so enough about me. We're going to talk about scaling, right? So first of all, why should we care about scaling? Um, I'll talk real briefly about kind of the evolution of, uh, of scaling. Uh, I'll talk about, you know, Docker, Kubernetes, Function as a Service, Serverless, Knative, Java, Quarkus. Then, uh, of course, you know, I have it in my title that I was going to scale, you know, from zero to 100 pods. So hopefully <laughs> I can prove that. And then uh, I'll, I'll show some links. So that's kind of uh, the idea of the talk. So horizontal uh, scaling, why, why should we care about that? And <laughs> I need to be careful here with the stage. Um, so uh, on the one hand, you want to use only the resources that you need. And that's really important, right? We want to focus on using uh, the least amount of resources for the most amount of outcome. So in terms of uh, money, right? If we're in the in the cloud, this is important. Where we're not spending more than we need to, but it's also you know important for the environment. That's why I have the two little trees there. So you know, less resources means you know we're using less electricity, and um, you know Mother Earth is a little happier. So why not, right? Um, but horizontal scaling. Um, is also interesting for things like uh, rolling deployments, right? So canary deployments, where uh, you're going to deploy a new version and then you know slowly move your traffic to to the new version, right? By taking down some pods and scaling up new pods that have the new version. Uh, a B deployments, blue green. You, you know, I'm sure you're you're familiar with some of these terms. And if not, you know, come talk to me afterwards. Um, it's also important for uh, handling unpredictable loads, right? So. Typically, most applications don't have the exact same load the whole time. So, you know, if we can scale up some more, uh, some more instances to handle that traffic and, and scale them back down when we don't need them, you know, that's that's ideal. Uh, in terms of high ability, high availability as well. Um, you know, if we just have one instance running, if that goes down, well, then we're out of luck. You know, if we have multiple instances running and one goes down, well, then we still have more instances and ideally, you know, ha scale some more up to, to handle that uh, extra traffic. So that's, uh, that's important too. Um, and overall, you know, if we can scale in a manageable way, uh, we can grow our applications, you know, kind of organically and, and we don't like have to worry too much about, you know, how are we going to handle, you know, the, ideally the day when we get more and more interest in our applications. Um, one thing, though, with uh, especially horizontal scalability, right, so when we have multiple instances uh, running at the same time of, of the same code, uh, we need to be. We need to make sure that our our code can handle it. Um, we don't want to have uh, multiple uh, instances running that hit the same database, doing the same operations, and and there's some kind of kind of conflict or race condition or something. So you know, be be mindful of that. So ho horizontal scaling is is important. 
Um, for those who aren't familiar with kind of the difference between horizontal and vertical scaling, so horizontal scaling means, you know, you basically create more instances uh, of the same uh, application. Vertical scaling means, you know, you're basically putting more resources into uh, into the, the the machines to to be able to handle more uh, more load. Um, and when you can't scale, fa you know, scaling, you have to be able to handle it, right? I mean, if you scale up um, uh, and, and the instances don't come up fast enough, then the load is still going to end up on the same uh, application and you end up with, uh, you know, weird situations um, kind of like this. Um, so, like the evolution of scaling, uh, at least in, in, uh, in my experience, in, in my career path, uh, back in the day, it, you know, when we wanted to scale out, it would mean, you know, provisioning a new machine and then, uh, you know, doing something like rsync to copy over uh, every time we do a release. And, you know, so that's not really ideal. I'm, I'm sure everybody has different experiences and different uh, war stories to tell. Um, but, you know, it, it's not ideal, right? So then um, containers came onto the scene and made scaling, uh, you know, relatively easier to do because now you have you know kind of a pre-packaged instance and you can you know duplicate that fairly easily and most of the time that goes well and yeah sometimes it does not really go that well but you know most of the time it does <laughs> um, so there's uh, you know the first kind of main um, let's say container uh, project that that became popular was Docker of course. Um, and so, you know, with Docker, you can uh, you can scale. So, with let's say regular Docker, you can uh, you can create multiple containers and then you know put some sort of load balancer in front of it. Um, but then, you know, there's uh, Docker Docker Compose and, uh, and and Podman Compose. Podman is an, an you know an, another project to be able to do uh, to to run containers on your uh, on your machines. Um, and with Docker Compose, you can scale. Uh, fairly easily, right? So you can do, for example, Docker Compose, scale my service, and then, you know, 100 instances or whatever. Um, but it is a manual process, so you have to, you know, give uh, Docker those commands or you have to write some sort of automation. So it's a little bit tedious to, to be able to do that. It's actually not very scalable in the sense that it doesn't, you know, automatically scale when there's more uh, requests coming in. So you know, it's it's cool and it works for smaller use cases, but you know, when you're really kind of uh, thinking about, you know, scaling out rapidly, you need something else. So uh, that's where Kubernetes came, uh, came on the scene, you know, as one of the reasons why uh, Kubernetes kind of was superior for orchestrating containers, um, because it kind of out of the box uh, has this uh, HPA, horizontal pod auto scaling. And so horizontal pod auto scaling, uh, you know, you can do, for example, kubectl, autoscale deployment, and then uh, set a minimum amount of uh, pods and a maximum amount of pods. And then uh, Kubernetes will look typically or by default at the CPU load of your, of your, of your pod, of your container. And uh, when it hits a certain percent of usage, then it'll, uh, it'll create some more pods. And it has, you know, a built-in uh, uh, service uh, load balancer to be able to route the traffic automatically and you know if a pod goes down somewhere it'll reschedule it somewhere else or maybe a node goes down it'll reschedule so it's pretty cool right um, Kubernetes uh, does this really well but the downside is that because it's typically based on uh, on metrics and by default on CPU it means that it's pulling these metrics and it takes a little bit of time uh, for it to really like realize hey I need to scale um, and so um, it's, it's not super fast. It's, it's somewhat fast, but not super fast. And so, you know, it's, it's a good solution for, let's say, more classic architectures where, um, you know, our applications don't need to react, you know, very immediately to, to, to the different loads. Um, but there's still kind of a little bit of lag in terms of how Kubernetes does it uh, by default. So then some other projects 
started up and the concept of serverless was uh, born. And so, you know, serverless, one of the premises of, of serverless is that it can scale from, from zero to X amount of pods and does this really fast and really well. Um, now, serverless, the term itself, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of the, of the term, uh, as you can see here. So, I mean, there are still servers underneath. Um, but the concept of, uh, of serverless and, and what it can do is really cool and really interesting. So uh, let's, let's uh, find out a little bit more about that. So the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, they uh, have this definition for serverless, and I think it's a, it's a pretty good one, actually. Um, so basically, applications, on the one hand, don't require uh, server management. So the idea is that you know, you're not worried about how to deploy and necessarily where to deploy. Um, I just have my application code and I want it to run somewhere. Um, and on the other hand, it's about the deployment model. So uh, being able to deploy an application, scale it from you know, zero when there's no usage to X amount of pods when it is being used. And, and so that means we can scale it very rapidly, we can be billing kind of more on demand and uh, really make it to the exact demand needed at the moment. So, uh, you know, a pretty good description of what, what serverless is or should be. Um, and so here you can see, you know, of course, we have to have graphs, right, to, to prove uh, the legitimacy of, of our statements. Um, so here you can see, for example, um, in a not serverless way, uh, you have to provision a certain amount of resources, be it pods or servers or whatever, um, to be able to handle spikes in traffic, right? And then uh, when the traffic goes down or up or down, you still have basically, you need to over-provision in case of, of these traffic spikes. And even then you run into, you know, the possibility that, you know, there's a big spike, spike of traffic and you're not, you're not able to scale up fast enough and you're still losing, you know, requests, customers potentially, um, or users or whatever it is that, that, uh, that's happening in your application. Uh, and so we don't want that. So, and, and then on the other side, we can see with serverless how it can scale really nicely based on, uh, on the demand. It's, going, it, it's able to handle that if you configure it right, of course. Um, so there's this kind of evolution in the world of, uh, of serverless. So the initial idea of serverless was very much focused on functions as a service. Um, so... Uh, who here uses AWS Lambda, for example? Okay, yeah, that was like the, the, the first real uh, um, application of fun functions as a service, right? So AWS Lambda does uh, a pretty good job, right? You have your code and you, you know, basically tell, uh, tell Amazon AWS, uh, hey, deploy my code and uh, it'll, you know, automatically take care of the deployment and the auto scaling and whatever more. But it's a fairly limited use case, right? Because you're, you're limited to just running functions. And um, typically, you're not just running a function, you have to like integrate it with some more components. And um, of course, you know, the, these, uh, the AWS lambdas, the Azure functions in, uh, of the world, uh, they, they think this is a really cool thing because, you know, you have, you have to do it with their services. And so you're locking yourself in pretty, uh, pretty hard with, with these services. Um, so then kind of the next step in this serverless evolution was like, why can't we just use containers to do uh, serverless? Containers gives, give us a lot more flexibility to be able to, um, you know, deploy whatever we want, right? Because with functions of service, we have to uh, have a certain structure to our code and, and only certain programming languages are supported. Whereas with, ser uh, with, whereas with containers, um, it doesn't matter what you put in them technically, right? I mean, uh, as long as it can run in a Linux container or perhaps even a Windows container, you're, you're basically good to go. So this gives, you know, a possibility for a lot more use cases. So not just functions as a service, but also microservices. Uh, technically, it doesn't even have to be a microservice. It can be, you know, kind of any service. But since it needs to start up pretty quickly and uh, scale fast, you typically you're not necessarily going to run like very big monolithic uh, applications in it, of course. Um, and thanks to, you know, it being containers, you can also debug and test more easily than, uh, than with uh, our, our first use case. And then 
um, let's call it serverless 2.0. Um, the thing is with serverless or, or with applications in general, they don't typically run by themselves, right? You need to have oftentimes some state to them. You need to integrate with, uh, with different components. And serverless is a really good use case for, uh, for events, right? So if we can plug in events really easily into, into these uh, systems, that actually makes a lot of sense because you know, events typically come in you know, very, in a very irregular way. So, uh, and, and that's what the, the kind of the 2.0 tries to address with, uh, you know, plugins for let's, you know, a, a Kafka or just HTTP requests or uh, other kind of messaging and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of the evolution of serverless up to today. Um, so functions of service, uh, serverless containers, and then uh, ser basically serverless eventing, if you will. Um, so, one of the uh, things in, in the title of my talk was Knative, so <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about mostly in terms of uh, serverless frameworks today. So, why, why do I think Knative is interesting? Uh, first of all, it's open source, and I'm a big fan of uh, open source. Um, it's a cloud agnostic solution, so you know, you're not tied to just one cloud provider. You can use Knative uh, in any cloud as long as it runs on top of uh, Kubernetes. So it's basically an extension of Kubernetes. So it allows you to build serverless and event-driven applications. So you know, some of the main uh, things that it does, it makes containers easy, so it, it uh, allows you to deploy containers uh, very easily. Uh, it supports functions as a service, so uh, in an open source way, so you're not locked in. You can use uh, functions um, basically, again, wherever Kubernetes is, uh, is running. Um, and, you know, so that means it's ready for the hybrid cloud because you can run a Kubernetes. You know, I can run it on my laptop, I can run it in my local data center, and I can run it kind of anywhere. Knative also has this uh, concept of, of revision. So, you know, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with Git where uh, every time you know you push your code, it creates a new revision, and then you can roll back uh, if you need to. Uh, so Knative has something similar. So every time you push your code or you change the configuration, it creates a new revision, and that allows you to either uh, route your traffic between different revisions or you know allows you to roll back. So that's kind of built into, which is pretty cool. Um, because it's containers, uh, virtually any programming language is is supported. Uh, it has out of the box um, auto scaling. So out of the box, uh, you can uh, when there's no request coming in, um, it's not going to start up any pods. And as soon as requests come in, it's going to notice, hey, something is happening here. I'm going to scale up some pods. So going back to uh, Kubernetes and it and its auto scaling. Remember how I said it's uh, based on metrics and uh, typically on the CPU. Uh, this is why in Kubernetes, you can't really scale to zero because it's looking for uh, what's happening in a container, in a pod that's running to be able to determine whether it needs to create more instances. Uh, with Knative, it's looking for requests that are coming in to your service. And so, you know, it can scale down all the way to zero because it's just looking at the request. And then once a request comes in, it can scale up or, you know, you can set it to uh, minimum amount of pods three or whatever. It doesn't need to be zero, but it can be, and and that's pretty cool. And Knative lends itself really well to event-driven uh, architectures. So what's in uh, Knative? On the one hand, you have a serving component, um, so you have the concept of a, of a Knative service that uh, automatically, when you create a new Knative service, it's going to create the deployment, it's going to create the route and everything, so you don't need to worry about any of that, right? That's part of that serverless promise of, you know, you don't need to worry about the server management. Um, then there's the revisions part, which uh, I already talked about, and again, it, it creates a route. So that's the serving part that allows you to scale up and scale down. On the other hand, uh, Knative uh, has an eventing component that, that allows you to create uh, sources. So for example, it can, you can create a Kafka source and it'll plug in with, uh, with your Kafka stream. And um, that makes it quite a bit easier to work with, uh, with event sources because 
um, it by default it'll send those requests to your application that you plug it into as as cloud events so cloud events is basically a, a standardized uh, way that CNCF has defined to send send events now what's cool about that is that um, you don't need to define anything Kafka uh, or AMQP or you know any kind of uh, messaging uh, definitions in your code because you you can just accept cloud events and then the Knative framework that's where you can you can configure a, a, a source whether it's a Kafka source or or a, or a ping source or whatever and then uh, so your configuration can be there and your application can be agnostic and if one day you switch from uh, from Kafka to another uh, uh, system that uh, that sends messages or events or you want to change from HTTP to a, to Kafka or something, then it's very trivial to do. You just create a new source and you're good to go. You don't need to change anything in your code to be able to do that. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. It has a, a lightweight broker uh, in, uh, included too, so it can route uh, the events to you know, either one event to multiple services or multiple uh, events from different sources to the same uh, to the same service. So it has some really cool capabilities, at least I think so. Um, so when we're talking about serverless, though, um, Java isn't the most popular language. Now, you know, I, I personally st still like Java, and I'd like this to go up. Uh, but our little friend here, the, the Java mascot, Duke, he's, uh, he's not too, uh, too happy about this. He's like, hmm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of these, uh, of these stats. So how can we make the adoption of serverless uh, for Java uh, increase first of all we need to think about you know like what w why is it that Java isn't so popular for serverless well traditional Java wasn't necessarily designed for serverless right the traditional Java application is designed uh, for high throughput it's designed to be long running you have you know your Java application that you, that needs to be really stable and um, you can uh, you know has a lot of dynamic loading in it and everything and so you know in the traditional world where we had big servers that were running you know full you know all the time and they would you know the idea at least was that they would never go down uh, this made a lot of sense right but so in uh, in our container world that makes a lot less sense because we have containers that go up and down and uh, get rescheduled somewhere else and they need to start up pretty quickly because you know there's there's traffic coming in um, and Java you know kind of tends to like to eat it, you know all its resources that it has available to it so you want to be careful in the container world that it doesn't you know like uh, use too many resources and you know you can set limits or uh, requests or whatever in Kubernetes but you know that then you run the risk that your application has really weird side effects too. Um, so, you know, not super ideal, but, you know, what about our existing uh, Java skills that we have and our expertise? Do we really need to throw that all out the window to, you know, now start writing applications in a different language? Um, you know, ideally, no, right? I mean, and, and our, our friend, uh, Mr. Duke there, isn't too, uh, too thrilled about that either. Um, so that's where uh, projects like uh, Quarkus uh, kind of address the, the demand for, for, for Java and, and are using our expertise for Java, uh, but being able to uh, serve that a lot quicker. So Quarkus is a, uh, you know, the, the title is Supersonic Subatomic Java. So on the one hand, Supersonic, uh, it starts up really fast. It, uh, it runs really fast. Uh, subatomic, so an atom is fairly small, right? And subatomic is even smaller than an atom. So it's, you know, it ha it's much smaller than a typical uh, Java application. And, you know, it's still Java. So it's very much based on uh, Java standards. And so we don't have to like reinvent the wheel and, and uh, redo uh, everything that we've done. And so Duke is happy now with Quarkus. Um, so what is, uh, what is Quarkus? It's a uh, it's a distributed a stack to build distributed systems, right? So typically, uh, Quarkus is built for uh, running in uh, in in uh, in containers in Kubernetes. That's that's the sweet spot of Quarkus. Can you run it outside of a container? Absolutely, um, but it is you know the, the the main use case is to run it in uh, in containers. So Quarkus is based on Java standards. So like I said, it doesn't like redo everything, create new and stuff like that. 
um, it, it really tries to focus on you know sticking with the standards that we already know, and it tries to do as much as possible, tries to move as much as possible to the build phase, so that you know. Uh, when the application starts up, it doesn't need to do a bunch of dynamic loading, and that takes a long time. Um, so Quarkus tries to do it all ahead of time so that when it starts up, it's really fast. Um, so it does that by minimizing the runtime dependencies. It looks for uh, you know beans that aren't used uh, in, in, in your code, or at least it thinks aren't used. And so it tries to do all this kind of uh, smart stuff to be able to eliminate as much as possible and start up uh, really fast. Now, you can, uh, you know, if if there's a, a bean that you're saying, well, this actually does need to be used. Of course, you can tell Quarkus uh, leave this one alone. Um, Quarkus also enables uh, native builds with GraalVM. So, who knows about uh, GraalVM here? All right. So, GraalVM for those who don't uh, basically allows you to compile, you know, for example, a Java application down to uh, a native. Uh, executable, so you know, in a in a Linux container, for example, it, uh, you can run your application as a native Linux uh, uh, binary, and that helps it be a lot faster, right? You don't have to have a JVM in your in your container anymore, so it has uh, a lot less resource usage, is much smaller, starts up faster, and so you know, Quarkus isn't the only uh, language that that you can use with uh, GraalVM, but Quarkus does make it a lot easier. So with Quarkus, you don't actually really need to know about GraalVM. You can uh, just tell Quarkus, hey, compile this as a native, and uh, either you have GraalVM on your local machine, it'll use it, or uh, if you don't and you have Docker or Podman running, uh, it'll pull down a container and it will actually do build, uh, build your binary in, uh, in a container. So it makes it really easy uh, and cool. Um, and Quarkus also brings developer joy, but uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a, in a little bit. Um, so in terms of usage, you know, just of course, we have to have more graphs, right, to, to prove it. Um, so on the one hand, we have, uh, let's say, a traditional cloud native stack that's built in a, in a different framework, a different Java framework, um, a, a fairly simple one, right? So it uses 136 megs of, of memory. Um, then we wrote the exact same application uh, with, uh, with Quarkus tools. And uh, running it on the JVM because, of course, you can also just run uh, Quarkus as a, as a regular uh, Java application, and you can already see, you know, using a lot less resources. And then if we compile it down to a to a native binary, um, we're down to 12 megs of of, uh, of RAM. So that's you know much smaller footprint in terms of uh, memory usage, also in terms of uh, of the size of the container image. Um, but what's also really cool is that it starts up like super fast. So if you look at you know the kind of the same comparison, on the one hand you have your traditional Java application taking about 4.3 seconds, which in my experience is still pretty fast. <laughs> um, I've <laughs> I've worked with Java applications that take quite a bit longer, but hey, 4.3 seconds. Um, but it's still not ideal, right? I mean, if you go to a website, for example, and you have to wait four seconds, that's one, two three, four, that's a long time. So, you know, that's not really ideal if we want to move to more serverless where we scale up on demand and scale down on demand. Um, so we want something that definitely starts up sub-second. And so here you can see Quarkus on the JVM barely reaches that with uh, just under a second, which, you know, that's pretty acceptable. And then if you compile it down, to the native again, you can really see how much faster an application can start up. So that really makes it a good candidate for serverless. And if we compare it with uh, with Node.js or Go, it's actually uh, very competitive, if not sometimes even faster than. So that's uh, that's really cool. So we can still use all our cool Java stuff and uh, and scale a lot faster. Now. Okay, you're thinking this is a really simple application. I have a more complex application. Um, you know, so your mileage may vary a little bit, but you know, maybe you need to rethink your architecture if you want to go to serverless because the, you know you want to keep it small and ideally a little more distributed. Doesn't mean like your entire architecture needs to be serverless, right? You can have certain components that 
uh, are serverless that can scale up that aren't used you know consistently but maybe your your main entry point to your application can run as a as a regular deployment so you you know you can and then use some microservices behind it that can scale up based on the demand so you know based on uh, on your usage of course um, so you know going back to my fancy graph here you can see on the on the left side with Quarkus you can really scale very fast because the application will actually you know, respond as fast as it needs to. If your application starts up slow, then you know, maybe Knative or whatever serverless framework you're using is able to scale fast, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that you're able to handle that. Um, what, what is interesting with Knative too, though, is that it, uh, it has uh, a built-in kind of uh, back pressure. So if uh, requests come in and your pod isn't scaling uh, up fast enough, it'll actually hold the requests for a little bit. So that also makes it uh, pretty cool because a typical um, Kubernetes will be like, well, there's no pod for it. Well, we're, we're out of luck for it. And uh, then the requests go nowhere. Um, all right, so zero to 100 pods in seconds, you know, I guess I have to prove it. Um, so I have Knative deployed on, uh, on OpenShift because I'm uh, at Red Hat and I have OpenShift clusters available to me very easily. So that's how I'm gonna show it, but you can run Knative on any Kubernetes and uh, you know, so be, feel free to do it however you want to. For me, this is the easiest and, uh, and why not? So here in, uh, in OpenShift, I have this developer perspective, and then I can create a new project, and we'll call it Fox or something. Yeah. And this will create a new namespace for me. And uh, so what I have is a fairly simple um, Quarkus application with uh, one endpoint, uh, a greeting endpoint, it's uh, yeah, super complicated. <laughs> um, it just shows some text and uh, shows uh, which pod is being used and how many times it's been uh, it's been requested. And then um, there's uh, there's a my resources endpoint where it shows the resources that are being used. And then there's another endpoint to consume uh, some uh, you know basically does some calculations to to create some load in the in the application. But overall. Very, uh, very standard and basic uh, application in Quarkus. And for those who are familiar with Java, this should look fairly uh, straightforward, right? There's no magic in there that you're saying like, wow, Quarkus uses all these weird things that I've never heard of. It's very much uh, standard based. So what I've done is I've, I've uh, basically done a Maven, um, Quarkus, uh, actually not Quarkus, uh, package p native and by using the profile native uh, Quarkus will you know compile my application as a native um, application and then you can see here you know it's trying to pull this uh, container image because it noticed I, I don't have GraalVM uh, running on my local machine is gonna uh, it, but it notices that I happen to have Podman running on my machine it's going to pull down the container and, and uh, basically build my application in the container. So we're not going to wait for this, so I'm just going to kill it. And um, I'm just going to uh, show you a, a pod that I've already pushed to my, um, to my Quay here. So here uh, I, I created an an, a pod or a, sorry, a container image that's called Quarked and uh, with the tag Voxed, of course. And uh, you know, well, ignore my uh, my high uh, security vulnerabilities. Let's uh, just assume that they're not there. <laughs> and um, here I can tell OpenShift uh, deploy my application, my container image, and of course I have to give it a cool runtime icon. It has to be Quarkus. And then uh, you know, give it whatever name and stuff like that. But so here, uh, you know, this this is an open shift out of the, the the choice between the regular deployment or serverless deployment. And you can see here it uses uh, Knative underneath. So so basically, OpenShift serverless is uh, is Knative. And then uh, I can you know automatically create a route and whatever more. I'm going to go to deployment. No, sorry, to scaling. 
And I'm going to say, at the minimum, I want to use zero pods. So if there's no requests coming in, I don't want to use any resources. And then uh, maximum pods, well, let's say 130, because I don't want to like over <laughs> overdo it either on, on my, I have a, a fairly small cluster. Um, and then concurrency target uh, is another term in, uh, in Knative to basically say how many concurrent requests can go to this particular container. So in this uh, instance, I just want my container to handle one request at a time. So if there's multiple requests coming in, then uh, create more containers. So I want my containers very lean, very small, doing just one thing at a time and not use uh, resources and really take advantage of, of auto scaling. So we'll set that as the limit too. The target is a soft limit. The limit is like, well, it really uh, can't have more than one request at a time coming in. Um, then, you know, the concurrency utilization basically means that uh, how much percentage of the utilization needs, uh, needs to be used before we start scaling up. In this case, it doesn't matter because I've already set the limit to one. So, you know, if it's 70% of one, it's still, you know, like one request is coming in. And this auto scale window is also uh, interesting. So that means, um, so by default, Knative will, uh, you know, if no requests come in, it'll keep uh, at least one pod running in case, you know, more requests come in within a certain amount of, uh, of time so that, you know, it doesn't have to like all of a sudden pull a new container and, and scale it up because it does, you know, take sometimes a little bit of time. So you can give it a limit of, you know, a few minutes or, or a few hours even depending on your use case. In my uh, in my case, I'm just setting it to 30 seconds. So uh, after 30 seconds of no request, it's just going to go to sleep. That makes it a lot easier to uh, to show you how to uh, how to do that. Anyway, so I'll create this uh, this application, and um, we'll see. You know, hopefully, it started up pretty fast. So now it's pulling down a, a container, and then uh, and actually, uh, it's already scaling it up. And then uh, if we go to uh, our, um, our uh, the, the route to it, you can see it's already running, right? So that, this is a Java application, so you know, very fast. And um, you, we can see here, um, if I go a little bit bigger, we can really see Vox Days Luxembourg. And then uh, we can see here the name of the pod, and there's been one uh, request coming to, to, this, uh, to this pod. Um, so, that's fairly simple, right? But I said 100 pods, so this is only one. And now it's already auto scaled to zero because I'm not sending any requests to it. So it's just sitting there, not using any pods, no resources being used. Um, and as you can see here, the pod is terminating and soon enough it'll go away. Um, we'll look at the logs in a little bit to see actually how, how fast it started up. Um, but let's, uh, let's send some load to it, right? So here I have uh, this, um, if I can find it, a little script, and it uses Siege to send a bunch of requests to it. So in this case, it does one repetition of 150 concurrent requests to my service. So what I'm going to do is, uh, first I'm going to go to my project, and hopefully I'm still logged in. Yes. And then, uh, so there's a service here. So kubectl yeah, or knative get service, uh, knative list service, knative service list. All right. So here, here we can see, you know, this is the this is my service that I've deployed, and so basically. Uh, and you can use, like you see, you can use kubectl as well, or OC or whatever you want to use to get the service. And then uh, I'm just going to send a bunch of requests to that. So let's see how that goes, right? Crossing our fingers. Okay. So the server is now under siege. We're going to send a ton of requests to it. And uh, as you can see, they're already going through. And here, uh, our pods are scaling up really fast, right? You can see like 100 and I think I set the limit to 130, so uh, it shouldn't go higher than that. And then uh, it's gonna handle all those, you know, create the containers and, and handle those requests very fast. Um, in this case, what I could have done, because by default, when you create a service, 
uh, uh, it, it uh, by default is defined to pull a container image every time. What I could have done is I could have said, hey, uh, don't pull a container image if I already have it, and then it, will, it would actually have gone even faster. But in this case, you can see you know, it, it took all those requests, handled them, scaled up, handled all those requests, and now it's scaling all the way back down because I just sent a bunch of requests and then nothing else. So, you know, there's some use cases where, where, this is, uh, where this would be really interesting, right? I mean, we have cron jobs that come in from, from somebody or somebody's sending a bunch of requests or maybe we were uh, on a TV ad and all of a sudden everybody's flooding to your website or, you know, there's tons of use cases like that, of course, where we have a big burst of traffic, we can handle it. And you know we can handle it in a way where we're not paying you know, like you know for all these uh, resources to be running all the time. We're just paying for that particular moment in time that we're doing it. So um, that's what Knative, for example, can do. Um, and then you know it plugs into like I said events and stuff like that too. So you know I could create uh, a Kafka source. You know so for example I can do that here uh, in OpenShift. With its fancy UI, if the little arrow wants to stay, well, whatever. I'll just do it like this: add to application, and then I can add an event source. You know, so for example, well, a Kafka source isn't defined right now because I don't have the uh, the Kafka plugin installed. But you know, so that's the idea, at least, that you can do that very easily with uh, with Knative. All right, so. Then back to our slides. Like I said, Quarkus, other than scaling up really fast and using a lot less resources, I didn't show you that, I guess. Um, maybe if we, we have time, I'll, I'll show you the logs. It, those applications really did start in, in, uh, in a couple of milliseconds, so it's, uh, it's really cool. Um, but Quarkus is cool for uh, its developer tools as well. So one of the things that's, uh, that always kind of bothered me in Java is uh, if I'm testing, and um, I want to change some code and then you know, see how it reacts based, uh, in a browser or in, uh, in a command line or whatever, or even when I'm unit testing is I have to recompile, right? And then uh, redeploy it. With Quarkus, you can start up in dev mode and uh, it's just gonna watch for changes happening in your code and it's gonna reload automatically. So you know, basically I, I change my code and I refresh in the browser and it's, uh, it's immediately there. So you know, that's pretty cool for, for Java if you're you know, a developer of another language like Node.js or PHP or something. Okay, this isn't so exciting, but you know, for us Java developers, this is uh, pretty cool. Um, so, uh, Quarkus is uh, is a toolkit, not necessarily a framework. So you can use uh, Java EE. You can even use uh, Spring Boot. There's Spring Boot extensions to work with uh, with Quarkus. Um, but it, you know, again, it's very much based on on standards. Um, it streamlines the code. It has a unified configuration and all that. Um, what one of my favorites in in Quarkus too is uh, is the Dev services. So. Um, uh, who knows test containers? So basically, Dev Services leverages test containers to uh, create uh, services kind of on the fly. So if I'm testing on my local machine uh, and my application uses a database or or a Kafka or something, but I don't want to you know install a database on my local machine and configure it or you know put a, you know install an entire Kafka cluster on my local machine, actually. What these dev services do is if I don't have a URL defined in my, in my properties for, let's say, Kafka or a database, it's just going to spin one up in a, in a container for me to, to test with. So it, you know, it, it gives a lot more flexibility to, to be developing. Um, there's things like Panache, uh, you know, kind of an active record uh, um, based on uh, Hibernate. Uh, has simplified logging, so I, you know, if uh, I, I can just set uh, Quarkus, uh, you know, in, in my Quarkus code log, blah blah blah. I don't have to define it anywhere else, um, and it has extensions for a whole bunch of things, uh, including Kubernetes. So you can just deploy directly, you know, from Maven to Kubernetes to OpenShift very easily, um, including configurations, config maps, secrets, and stuff like that. So it makes it very nice and easy to work with the more modern cloud services. Um, what's also cool about Quarkus is that it uh, unifies imperative and reactive programming. So 
for those who aren't familiar with the difference, um, imperative programming basically means you know each statement gets uh, processed. Uh, whether it's I/O, then it blocks until you know the you know the, that statement is is executed and then it moves on. Whereas with reactive, it basically you know puts the I/O on an event loop. Uh, on a loop, and uh, it'll continue executing the code, so it's non-blocking, which uh, which has some advantages, but also makes it a little more complicated. But anyway, with Quarkus, you can combine the two based on uh, how, how you want to do your programming. And Quarkus has uh, a, a whole framework of uh, of different ex extensions that you can add to Quarkus to work with. You know, a Camel uh, with uh, Keycloak or with Prometheus, or you know, a whole bunch of different. Uh, project, so that makes it really fun too. Um, and that uh, is about the end of my presentation. So right after this, uh, a shout out to my colleague Alexandre, who will be in, uh, I think, in Amiga OS talking about uh, Camel and uh, Quarkus. And this is really, really cool too. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, and uh, here's the source code for my super complicated demo. And uh, if you want to test it out, uh, there's, we have this developer sandbox that we offer uh, for free at Red Hat, where you get a, a small OpenShift cluster, and it has serverless NK Native already installed on it. So you can actually apply this code to the developer sandbox. And then uh, you can test it out and let me know um, if, uh, if it works or not. And uh, you can yell at me if not, <laughs> uh, or create a pull request. Um, and that's it. So thank you for uh, for being here and uh, 